Well, thanks, folks. It's great to be here. So I've, I've heard a, a rumor that you you have um, pissed off your, your professor, right? So here's the first tip on negotiating. Do not piss off a lawyer, right? They're just <laughs> not a, you know, they're, they're just mean. They're, you know, just <laughs> so no, it's great to be here. And, and this is your session. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of, about what I've learned about negotiations, how I think about it, and um, answer any questions. And I'm going to do that sort of in the form of, of a, um, you know, a, a series of stories of, of things that I've negotiated and what's worked and what hasn't worked. So happy to do it. So, so jump in. So here are the things that, that I would tell you about negotiating as I think about them. Is, you know, it, it always helps to know your facts, right? And that's where one of the failure modes I see with students is they'll go into an important interview or something like that and just sort of not know the company and not know the stuff. So, um, but the facts provide context for both parties. So they, they tell you a lot about how the, the, your counterpart might act or you might act. So do your homework, really know those sorts of things. And then again, know your counterpart. Go on LinkedIn, see who they are, find out about the company, know, find out about the department, know something about them going in. Just makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you can, you know, from that you can start to gain their position and yours. Think about what those positions might know your position, your strengths, you know, whether you're in a position of strength or weakness or neutral. Um, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. If you don't have a lot of negotiating leverage, then that, that informs you about what you can do. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. One of the things I was, uh, I was sharing with um, Dr. Fick was um, when we were getting ready, to, or, or actually when I was running InView Corporation, which is the folks that made the electronic projection displays, one of our competitors was getting ready to go public, called InFocus, and they developed a very um, intricate, not very um, robust color technology. We had the, the most advanced color technology, but we had done a lot of work in their realm before. So as they're getting ready to go public, um, I realized that they were in a position of, of weakness because they're getting ready to go public. They have to disclose all their patent information and their whole claim for going public was that they were going to be the first people with color technology in the marketplace. Right? So they felt like they were in a position of strength. I looked at it and said, well, let me, let me um, think about this. And I knew that we had about 10 patent applications in their realm. So I waited for them to go pub or, or go into the Securities Exchange Commission, file their registration form, and then I just happened to find the time to let them know that we had 10 applications that might um, interfere with their patent applications, and they're getting ready to go public in 30 days. Miraculously, our fax machine, that was the technology back then, lit up with an offer very quickly to buy those patents from us, right? Because they were of no value to us. Tremendous value to them. So timing and knowing all this is, is important. Um, know yourself, right? Professionally know your strengths, your weaknesses. Um, understand your Myers-Briggs scores or your other scores, your strength finders, because that's going to tell you a lot about what you might decide to do. Um, and then also just your personal. You know, what are your limits? What are, what are your likes and dislikes and wants? Um, I see a lot of students who ignore these. I talked with an alum last night and she took a job that I thought was the wrong job for her. And she sheepishly admitted, yeah, just really didn't like that. And she admitted that she knew going in she wasn't going to like it. I said, so why did you take it? And I knew the, the answer. And she again very sheepishly said, well, because it was the highest salary. All right? Money's not everything. I know it's important, but She's now with a, uh, actually with a um, landscaping firm doing marketing. Now here's a finance and management graduate who was in the financial world and she's doing marketing in a landscaping company. It doesn't make any sense, but she loves it. Great people, great company. So find, find out what you like and want. And then know your, your parameters. You know, what's required? What do you require? Maybe you do require a higher salary because you have student debt to pay. I get it. Um, what's desired, what, what are you willing to throw in 
to a transaction? What are you willing to, to throw away? What are you willing to give away on? So if you know all those things, negotiation becomes a lot easier to, to deal with. Um, so I'll give you an example. Tommy Doyle, if some of you may know Tommy, was working for NASDAQ up in Richmond, and he had developed an application, an app, uh, for a cell phone for the financial and he, we talked a lot about it. He was willing to throw that in to say, hey, I'm willing to come to work for you if you will help me develop this application and move it forward, and it benefited both him and the company. So think about those things. Right, so let me stop right there. Questions, thoughts, observations on... What? Right. It was definitely, it was a win for us, yeah, and that was all I was cared about, right? And so it was a win for them because if we'd come out after they went public, we could have put a, a question mark, or if we'd be, be, uh, gone out publicly, we could have put a real dent in their going public. And so we looked at our position. We knew we were coming along with, with what was called active matrix color technology, far superior. Um, and actually, you know, part of our negotiation in that was we wanted them to go public and establish in the public marketplace that these were really important devices. So we actually kind of let them go go first. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I think in most cases, um, I I can. You know, I think there are times when you just have to. Uh, I think it's one of the big problems that we have is where people um, can't find a way to compromise. Because you're very seldom that you're in a position of strength like that where you just know that you have somebody um, that can really um, press your position. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's, it's important. And also, we didn't have to live with... Um, in focus, right? We were sort of mortal enemies, and so, you know, extracting a, a large check from that was was a win for for us, and um, getting them their ability to clear the decks and make sure that they're going public had no questions was a win for them. And if you think about it that way, so I want to clarify something: <clears throat> compromise is bad because people do it too quickly. So I have said to collaborate. Mm ask questions, try to find what is it they really need out of the deal, because if you compromise first right. without doing collaborative negotiation, there's waste, there's right. missed opportunities. So compromise is necessary at some point, because, or there, unless you have a really strong position, mm -hmm. because you're going to have to make concessions. But when you compromise first without doing the work on collaboration, that is when compromise is bad. Right. Collaboration has to happen first. Compromise will occur after collaboration. Right. All right? And so the, the problem is that people instinctively do compromise first, unless they've been trained in negotiation to do collaboration <coughs> first and then try to figure out where we can compromise and, and, right. and things that we don't really need that they want that we can easily give up in a concession. That's a great win-win solution in the end because they get something you don't really care about and then <coughs> they win. Mm -hmm. So that's principled negotiation at its finest. But compromise, the timing of compromise is very important. So compromise is necessary, as you said, there's the timing of the compromise that kicks in yeah. that changes the deal, changes the character of right. the deal. And if I, if I may, and, and you know, all apologies to Linda and the lawyers, and that is if you can possibly come to an agreement before you get the lawyers involved, typically it's really hard. Your lawyers are going to fight for the extremes, typically. That's and true. then compromise gets hard. I told so them that. <laughs> so if you can get in and negotiate and then give your lawyer a series of points that you've agreed on, it makes their job easier and getting to a final. Um, negotiation is much easier if you don't start with these polarized Lawyers positions. Lawyers don't care about relationships. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we 
care about our client. <laughs> right. That's it. We don't care about the relationships. So lawyers are not principal negotiators. Yeah, principals yeah. and lawyers, they sort of don't go together. <laughs> e ethics, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. My brother's a lawyer, so I can I can you know break bad on him. But so folks, it, it all depends. You heard me say that in 418. If you took me to that, you heard me say it in 491. It life all depends. It, it depends on on these facts. And so if you don't really know your environment well enough, you're gonna you're gonna make mistakes. Um, and you know if you're not honest with yourself about what you're trying to accomplish with these, uh, and just a you know free advice worth what you paid for it. You know, I see a lot of students who will take a job, and yes, it's not your dream job. Yes, it may not be in the company that you really wanted. And then they hang their heads and sort of say, oh, gee, woe is me. I didn't get the salary I wanted, the position I wanted. Don't do that. Right? Own your decision. Say, I took that job because it was a higher salary. I took that job because it was in Springfield and I wanted to live at home. I took that job because it's the only offer I had. Own that and then stand tall and go do a great job with it. Because as a boss, if I see you hanging your head and saying, woe is me, I'm putting you out of the leadership group. Right? That's just not an attitude that I want in my company. And you'll find that pretty. So don't wear those sorts of, of don't wear your negotiations on your sleeve. Was there a question over here before I interrupt? Ian, did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to ask if you had any advice, like in knowing your knowing yourself like once you figure it out kind of sticking to your guns with it so almost kind of what you were talking about with your student that ended up taking up your salary like mm -hmm. I, I definitely get in that position where like I'll go in knowing what I want but then suddenly you know there'll be a big number sitting in front of me or something that yeah. it, I end up liking and mm -hmm. you kind of forget everything in favor of that one small bit that you like. Yeah and, and that's just human nature I mean we'll go for shiny things on the beach but try not to do that right? and if you do to say own it. Okay, I took this job. I knew I wasn't going to like it, but I took it for the higher salary. And I forced Victoria to make that com that comment to me because I wanted her to own it. And she said, "Yeah, I, I should have." Not that I wanted to be right, but I wanted her to see that she, you know, she let herself down. I think when she did that. So, other questions, thoughts, observations. So I want to point out for those of you who had me in 491, this is basically just critical thinking, right? Knowing your perspectives, knowing you know what the other person's doing, taking you know your purpose. What's the purpose in this negotiation? Am I just trying to get a job or a higher salary? I mean, it all comes back to thinking critically and using the lateral thinking techniques we talked about. So, all right. So I'm going to share a series of stories based on. One of the companies I ran called Hughes JVC, and I just you can just read through this. This was a, a joint venture created by um, Hughes and JVC. And So that is a li liquid crystal light valve I'll pass around so you can all take a look at it. Um, so that's what Hughes had developed. Um, and so if you look at that, there are a lot of people to, to know and understand. Right? You've got Hughes, which was owned by General Motors at the time. JVC was owned by Matt Schuster at the time. So you know, in my due diligence in looking at these, I had to understand Hughes and to some extent General Motors and JVC and to some extent um, Matt Schuster and understand sort of all those parts. And it's a joint venture, which means you have two large companies trying to do something together and that's a pretty unstable situation. Right? Those two have to stay in agreement on what they're doing um, with this. So, um, well, how yeah. was a aircraft company Situated to make projection <laughs> television sets. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So Hughes Aircraft Corporation, Hughes 
Howard Hughes was one of the original aviators, had been involved in government contracting, had built um, airplanes for the, the federal government, and then they had a number of divisions, as a lot of these companies do. Hughes at the time was $17 billion when I worked for them. Um, and did you meet him? What's that? Did you ever I did not meet Howard Hughes. Um, uh, the guy I worked for was Mike um, Armstrong, who actually went on to be the head of AT&T. He had been the, the vice chair of, of IBM. Uh, so, um, but anyway, um, Hugh, or Hughes had a number of divisions that did a lot of things. One of them was a government contracting division that made all the, of the, where these were developed was for simulators, very high end color, full motion video um, simulators for aircraft. And that's sort of the tie is, you know, you build an aircraft and you, you don't want to fly, you don't want to give you know, a young pilot, a regular airplane to fly, you put them in a simulator, so if they crash it, right, they don't kill themselves and they don't blow up something that's worth a lot of money. So that's where the technology came from. And then what Hughes realized was they wanted to commercialize the technology and take advantage of it. And they weren't very good at that. They were a government contractor making small um, quantities, JVC, Conversely, owned by Matt Schuster, which was the largest um, electronics company in the world at the time. JVC was a very large audiovisual company and needed new products and new technology. So that was a great combination in theory to bring high volume manufacturing, worldwide distribution in the audiovisual channel together with an, an emerging, very exciting technology. So, yeah, Pete. That's a that's a huge range, and that was that's I'm glad that's a great lead-in because as I looked at this, and, and I'll I'll go in here. Um, this was a, the announcement. This you know big time. So this was in in Reuters, and um, that's one of the our devices and the, the liquid crystal device set back here. Um, so this was a, something about the size of this desk, and at the time was. Um, what, what did they say, $500,000? Um, yeah. Um, and the goal was to get it down to a con consumer sort of style. So that was, a, that was a big leap. And that's where, in negotiations, I spent a lot of time with due diligence figuring out, could that ever happen? Right? And, and so I, that's what I wanted to know, because I didn't want to go move my family out to um, San Diego and then find out, well, technologically, this is... A pipe dream. So that's a that's a great question. So that was the Wall Street Journal when it was announced, and um, so anyway, they approached me through a headhunter and said, you know, you're the guy uh, we want to hire you, and that that always makes you feel good, right? So you know, but you got to get your ego out of the way, and and we spent. The first approach was from one of their directors, a guy named Steve Kahn from Advent International, and Gareth Chang, who was the vice chairman of the newly formed joint venture. Uh, Gareth went on to run the Sky Network for Rupert Mur Murdoch. Um, and they approached me and said, you know, we want to meet in New York. We went up, and I said no. I said, you know what, I just, I'm not ready, willing to leave, you know, Enview at the time. My wife didn't want to go to San Diego. Um, and I was concerned about exactly that. How are you going to go from a $500,000 device that weighs 3,000 pounds, it is impossible to set up to something a consumer can just turn on and use? So that was a big concern that I had. Um, they came back and said, tell you what, what we'll do is we're going to hire you if you'll, you know, I was transitioning out of Enview at the time, We'll hire you for six months to negotiate how to do this. Can this be done? How can we make this joint venture work? Um, so that's how I got started. And the first thing was to say no. I looked at it and just said, you know, joint ventures are unstable. I don't think you're going to get there. But I was in a position of strength. They came after me through a headhunter. I was the only person at the time they were interviewing. Um, and so that just gives you the ability, if you know what you want and what your, your parameters are, to just say, you know, not me. And they came back and said, you know, let's negotiate this out and then you tell us what we should do. Um, so I spent six months flying all around the world meeting with Matt Schuster, with JVC, with Hughes, developing a strategy for how we could go to market 
together how we could do those sorts of things. Um, and that involved, um, at the very, very high end simulators, there were a lot of simulators in place that didn't use this technology. They used old three gun um, CRT technology. So we could refresh those, we thought. There were a number of emerging markets that looked very attractive. For instance, one that came to, to light. We did all of the tours for Microsoft Office when it came out. We did all the tours for the Rolling Stones. Um, so we did some really cool stuff on on the very, very high end side of things. And then what the plan was, if we couldn't get our technology down into that lower cost, is we were going to acquire um, one of the LCD projection display companies, as well as a, a Belgian company called Barco, the Belgian American radio company that made three gun projectors, and have every available technology at every price point. Um, and we, we negotiated that. Everybody agreed. JVC's board approved that. Um, Hughes's board approved that. GM's board, everybody agreed. Everything's good. I get a five-year contract um, f that included, you know, base salary, bonus, um, all my relocation expenses, and 5% of the joint venture, you know, as an equity position. So everything's great. But that comes from knowing markets and spending your time. Now, I had the luxury of negotiating all that, but that really came from saying no the first time. So back to your point, you know, have the courage. If it's not the right job for you, if it's not the right thing, if you don't have to take it, don't. And some old advice that a, a mentor of mine gave me years ago, he said, whatever opportunities you have, don't compare them to one another. Look at each one individually and take it as it stands. And, well, this one's got a better location, but this one's a higher salary. Just look at that one opportunity and go all the way you know, through your thought process on it. Because they're not comparable. You can't compare this salary to this salary because it's not the same job. When you said no the first time, or you said you were transitioning from a different company, did you have like your next step? So like what, what about like, I know like a bunch of my friends have job offers right now, but if they don't want them and they don't have any other job offer, like turning it down for nothing, like how do you kind of manage that, like knowing what to do next? Yeah, and that's a great question. And that's why I said, you know, in knowing this, know what your position is. If you have to take that job because your student debt's getting ready to kick in or whatever, and you just need the income, that may be, that may be the right decision for you to make in, in that particular time. I had the luxury, having run a publicly traded company and done very, very well financially, I could, I could afford to take some time off. I could afford to take that risk. That's not everybody. Right? I'll tell you an interesting story about um, three young men from CNU had a fantastic idea. We won um, business plan competitions in Texas at, at Texas Christian at, at Virginia. We had a um, venture capitalist in Texas wanting to move, actually a, a large angel investor, wanting to move them out to, to Texas. Some of the patent issues came in, started to delay, and all three of those young men had to take a job and abandon that idea, which is a brilliant idea because their student debt was starting to kick in and they had to go to work. And so those things happen. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but just realize you're making that decision for those reasons. Don't blame somebody else. Don't blame the economy. Don't blame the company. Own your decisions when you do it. Make sense? Thoughts? Questions? All right, so um, so I'm here. We are, and, and you know, ready to to um, go to work with Hughes JVC. Everybody's agreed to everything. It's all going um, swimmingly. As I say, we're we're doing. Um, we we got the contracts to do the, the concerts for a bunch of people, a bunch of um, you know successful companies. We're starting to negotiate the the. Um, uh, um, revising the technology in a lot of the simulators um, and I started negotiating to acquire these companies and we're at a board meeting six months nine months into my five-year contract uh, you know about nine months and we're sitting at a board meeting and the chairman of JVC says through his translator I'd like to ask Donaldson-san which is the honorific in, in, in Japan I'd like to ask him a question 
And he proceeds to ask, why are you, why are you pursuing this acquisition? And all four of us on the, on the Hughes side of the table were like, did we just hear what he just said? And the answer was, yep. So we had a break, went in and said, wait a minute, we approved this strategy to do all these things all the way up to the, to the top, got it approved, and now we're nine months in and they're asking, why are we doing this? And it just you know, proved people change their mind in negotiations, things happen. And then the other thing is the cultural differences are important. Um, JVC said yes, in large part, I think because they got pressure from Matusta, but it was the Japanese yes, which meant yes, we heard you, yes, that makes sense, but they weren't really intent on going ahead with it, from what we could tell. So long story short, go ahead. no, go ahead. When it comes to like cultural differences, do you think it's like how do you decide who kind of has to give into the other person's culture? Because like I know we've talked about in your past how like Asian cultures a lot of times will, like take you out for like a long time and want to not like get right down to business. Right. Not that's rude. Yep. So like Americans tend to do that, mm -hmm. but then they if they know that they tend to adjust. So like how do you decide who adjusts or just whoever adjusts? Yeah. It it. It gets back to what um, Dr. Frick was saying, that, that sensitivity, understanding, um, you know, knowing that going in, we spent a lot of time socializing the idea of the strategy. That's why I flew around and met all the people. And so we thought we'd done all, all the work to do that. But your point is, you know, very well taken. Very big difference culturally between the way American companies run and their board meetings and the expectations. A board meeting is supposed to be a place where decisions are made, whereas with the Japanese, it's really just a place to um, come together and socialize. And so when they asked that question, it was just a part of their thinking through this process. But for Jews, we were committed. We were going down the path to do these acquisitions, and it was the only strategy they were willing to put up because the 62 million that was there, we were up to $127 million invested at that time. Right? So these are big stakes. Um, and it just shows the difference is that um, some negotiations are never complete. No matter, they keep sort of winding on and people think they can negotiate. And, and in this case, the JVC really thought, well, yeah, that we're, we're willing to go to get to um, an agreement with Hughes, but but we'll think about this as we go forward. That's sort of the Japanese yes. So it's a, it's a very different thing. I'll have to tell you an interesting story. How many of you would feel comfortable negotiating your first relationship with a company in a sauna? In a sauna. In a sauna. Would you be comfortable with that? Well, that's my story. I went to I was setting up distribution um, around the world, and the best distributor, after all my research, was Sammy. Um, kicking in, in Finland. So I flew up to, to Finland. I got a meeting with him. I went expecting, you know, had all my negotiations, what I was going to do and, and how this was all going to go in my head. And I got to his assistant and she said, yes, um, Sammy's waiting for you. He's in the sauna. Here's your towel. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't part of my scenario planning, <laughs> right? <laughs> Little awkward. Um, but that's how they do it. That's how they socialize, or at least how he did. Right? So you just got to, sometimes you just have to go with it, right? Like I just like went on in and said, hey, Sam, <laughs> nice to meet you, right? You know? <laughs> Didn't? I feel like that's their own negotiation tactic. Absolutely. Yeah. And some of that, you know, <laughs> some, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you can't lie to them. Some of that's to get you out of your comfort zone, yeah. right? <laughs> Involved in that, oh. what if it, you were a woman negotiating yeah. with this person, and the laws are different. Yeah, abroad, like they don't have sexual yeah. harassment laws in right. other countries. Yeah. What what would you say to the women? Uh, you absolutely have to just stop at your value line. You know, if that's something you're comfortable with, I'm sorry. If not, you just have to say, I'm not going to do business that way. I'm I'm who I am and walk away from it. You have to set those limits, but you can't do things you don't want to do or 
or uncomfortable doing. Right? Yeah. Um, in Dr. McMahon's um, Food and Science Classic Directory book, Psychological Carlin Theory of Animals, he talks about how it's she had to go do an negotiation in a strip club, and so that was like a really hard thing for her because it was all men, and yeah. she just had to be like there. So mm-hmm. that's kind of an interesting thing to read about. Yeah, I had one of uh, the distributor in Germany that I set up. We became good friends, Wolfgang Lentz, and um, my <laughs> vice president of sales later on was setting up redistribution um, in some dealerships, and he wanted to send one of our absolutely best marketing people in. Um, Alicia, I'm going to forget her last name, and Wolfgang called me up and he said, can't have it. Females can't be successful in Germany. You know, and I thought that was nonsense. And I said, well, here's the deal, Wolfgang. I've um, known you a long time. Well, do you want our best person? He said, absolutely. I said, well, she's our best person. So you got two choices. You either don't get our support or you take her and you make her feel comfortable, you make her part of your professional team. Those are your choices. You have to defend your values. Um, and he called me up three months later and said, she's brilliant, you know, I want to hire her. So, but you're going to run into those stubborn things. You're talking about cultural differences. If you ever go to Russia, they're going to want you to, they're going to want to ply you with so much vodka that you do stupid things, right? <laughs> it's just that you have to know your environment you're going into. Don't laugh. When I ran the, um, I can't even remember the name of it. It's been so long ago, but it was um, uh, it was a the new business venture um, arm of a of a large hospital chain. Our CEO got hammered with the reps from IBM and bought our MRP system that night for us to install. And it was a disastrous product. It was a disaster. They didn't even have healthcare in their portfolio. But we got the job of implementing it, right? So it happens. <laughs> Don't let that be you, right? That's a cautionary tale. And American companies doing business abroad that violate American laws will be sued successfully in American courts. Absolutely. So the laws apply to American employees with American companies abroad. It, if you're working for a German company in Germany and you're an American, you don't have rights. You know, your gender discrimination laws don't apply. But if we're an American company doing business in Germany and you're an American in Germany working for us, or even if you're a German working in our American company, those laws apply. So you can your your American company can be sued in an American court where they are headquartered for gender discrimination, age discrimination, all of those things abroad. Because the laws still apply because it's an American company violating the law. It doesn't matter if it's happening in Germany. It's an American company doing it, right? Just gotta get that law out there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's so knowing these things, understanding um, what environment you're going to go into, and and understanding also that. There are different laws and different rules in these places, so you sometimes you have to, you know, maybe live with something you're not comfortable. I did a lot of business in Japan and Korea and China where their treatment of the female of the species is abhorrent in my in, in my world view. But you got to do business there, right? And you just have to say, okay, that's that's their culture. It's different. Don't like it, but it is what it is. Um, you know, my daughter ran into this. She was, uh, you know, a American female working for a Japanese company. So, you know, deadly. So you're not going to go anywhere. And I told her going in, you're, this is all going to be all about, you know, you learning your trade and getting good at what you do and working in the field that you want to work in. But you're going to run into these. Pressures, don't complain about them, don't whine about them, because you know they're going to be there. Um, So I was in RTC my freshman year, and Mm -hmm. we had to do a lot of training about, like, key leader engagements, where even if the head of, like, let's say your platoon is a female, but the person you're negotiating with is very uncomfortable with females, like, that then you would negotiate with, like, the next in command if it's a male, um, even though, like, they have no say. It could have been someone that, like, is a, like, Mm -hmm. has no authority. Um, just because it's easier to de-escalate situation. So kind of back to that Germany thing, what if the person had, like, what would you have done if they said, like, well, she's not going to be successful here, 
like send a different person? Would you have done it, or would you have just walked away? Again, it, it, it all depends. In that case, we didn't have anybody else to send, so I you know, didn't have that ability. Um, you know, could have waited six months and maybe gotten somebody, but I just, I also felt very strongly that Alicia deserved the opportunity, and I thought um, Wolfgang was sort of out of touch with his younger dealers, et cetera. So I think there, I think, you know, the mood was changing at that time, and he was just part of the, an older generation that wasn't a part of that and not comfortable with it. So that's why I say it all depends, and you have to read all these tea leaves. Um, that's what makes it hard. Other questions? All right, so let me propose, oh, okay. Yeah. okay. This is just something that I've been noticing, and I wanted to prevent it before it happens mm -hmm. when I get into my new workplace. I'm a young, high-energy individual, and so... I have, found so that, I have found that to be true, yes. <laughs> I'm like very positive, and sometimes that comes off as like naive, young, and dumb. And I do, it's true, but mm. I don't, I want to keep that energy and positivity mm -hmm. without the older generations of my face putting that label on me. So how do I go about that? Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big fan of just being straight up about it, you know, finding somebody that you disagree with or that takes it seriously and sort of say, hey, we have to get along. This is kind of who I am. Um, are there things we can work on to, to get better and, and, and meet in the middle? Um, I had two vice presidents one time that were sort of feuding and sparring, and you know, my solution was to bring them both in shove a copy of our values across the table to them and say, how are you two doing on these? Right? And I said, you know, by my, my sort of uh, estimate, you're neither one is doing well at all on these. So I can either fire both of you, one of you, or you, know, you guys better work it out because that's kind of where I'm headed. <laughs> and so I think you just have to, to you know, you, you can't avoid it. Right, particularly if you have to work together. And I think if you start from what you have in common, most people argue and fight over probably the last 10 or 7%. Right? But if you start with what you agree on and build your way up, you, I think you build a, a sense of common purpose. And then the, just the 5 or 7 or 10%. So I, I was part of a, a group that was brought in we, There's a to the South Florida Water District two departments openly feuding with one another. And that's our, our resolution was, we brought them together and started with, what do you agree on? And where do you have to agree so you, you can both be successful? And you, we came down to the fact that it was just a few things that had started a long time ago and just gotten more and more toxic, more and more polarizing. And most of it came down to very bad legislation passed on by the politicians that put them sort of at odds with each other. So the solution was that the two directors said, hey, you guys go do a great job. We'll take the heat and we'll go try to get the legislation changed. So if you, if you start from where you agree and where you have to get along, I think that helps rather than a lot of people start with where they're polarized. And yes, no? Helpful? So let me give you this dilemma. We come back from, from having met and, and we asked um, Mr. Shino, why do you ask that question of Mr. Donaldson? And, and he said, well, because we're not sure that we want to go ahead with these acquisitions. We believe we can get the cost of the technology down very quickly to become successful commercially. Um, we did not believe that. So now you've got a very differing you know, set of positions. Um, and so we said, all right, well, we'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, but you're in a joint venture. You've got, you've got to agree. Long story short, I went to um, Mike Armstrong the, and GM and, and Hughes' board and presented that they should sell their interest to JVC. I, just, I, think, I, don't, I told them I don't think the joint venture is stable. I don't think 
you know, it's in your best interest to say. Now picture this, folks. I got a house in California, a house in Virginia, a lunatic wife somewhere in between, <laughs> right? And I'm flying all over the world, and this is not in my best interest to say, hey, why don't you just let me go, <laughs> right? So what would you do? Most of you who know me know that I, all of my to-do lists start with drink heavily, so that was <laughs> first, right? And then you get to... <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, don't tell Paul. So do you stomp out and say, hey, I got a five-year contract to hell with you people, your problem. Maybe try to prove that they do need to do this revenge or like come up with a way that like to show them that it is worthwhile, I guess, if they have changed their mind, figure out why and then change back. <laughs> like, no, no, you can't do that. Prove it to us. I could enforce my contract, say, I don't really don't care, you guys solve it. Um, I'm just gonna <laughs> sit in my office and drink coffee, wait until you do. I didn't feel very good about that solution. But these are, these are sort of the hard things. So my choice was I went to Hughes and I said, look, I will work out this transition um, as long as a couple of things happen. One, you guys take care of me. You hired, you came after me, you hired me. I'll help you any way I can make sure this transition goes smoothly because I felt an obligation to the people that I who work for me and to both entities. Right? And this is part of, you know, I've just not seen good come out of, you know, storming out of places and demanding a whole bunch of stuff. It's always better to leave a good reputation. Particularly, I was a fairly young CEO. I wanted to go on to other things, right? And if you get a reputation as somebody who just enforces your contract or sues the partners or blah, 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 goes out in public, then I just don't think those things are helpful. So my, I felt my strength in the negotiation came from saying, look, I'll get you through this if you take care of me. And just, you know, that involved buying my house in California so I could move two houses, you know, flying me back and forth and making sure that um, I thought my reputation made a lot was the most important thing to come out of that. Holy, nobody's gonna, gonna, Hughes isn't gonna go under because of this, JVC's not gonna go under because of it. So I think that's an important part of this is knowing where your walk away limits are and what you're willing to, to live with. Um, now there's a, a bit of a wrinkle in that in that we sold Hughes's interest to JVC. I had that 5% equity and I was telling him this the other day. Um, it came back that JVC hadn't signed the equity agreement. Now, shame on me for not seeing that it was signed, but we've even agreed that Hughes signed it, it was signed, put in the, you know, not in the Wall Street Journal, but, you know, the, the terms of the deal were fairly well known. So again, choices to make, right? Again, I could have sued Hughes, Hughes sued JVC, um, but Hughes are the people that are taking care of me. Right? So that doesn't sound very good. Well, yeah, let me poke you in the eye with a stick. <laughs> not Probably not a good idea. And then the other was sue JVC. Well, the Japanese courts are, they're not exactly set up for you know, Americans to do well, particularly at that time. Right? And who knows if you'd ever find it. So again, I just went back and said, you know, uh, you get just get me situated. Fortunately, they put me on a longer term contract to do some consulting, and they tried to make good on it. But that's why I think if you if you conducted yourself well, people hopefully will help you out. Um, so you don't have to go to the lawyers and, and do those things. Yes, no. Now negotiating with my wife was an entirely different thing because. <laughs> Because they came after me and, and Mike Armstrong and, and Gareth Chang wanted me to go to Singapore and run Southeast Asian operations for them. And, you know, folks, I was, that was me. I mean, I was a hired gun CEO to go do really cool stuff. Um, and so I had my bags packed until my lovely bride Patty said, well, I'll be back in Virginia with the kids right and visit if you can, essentially. And 
she didn't want to go. And that's where knowing yourself and knowing your parameters, right? She begrudgingly gone to San Diego. Singapore was just a bridge too far for her. And so, you know, at that point I said, okay, I'm coming back to Virginia. And that was, that was a tough decision. Um, um, but I'll tell you, and it's an interesting part of the story, one of the things that convinced me is Mark Armstrong, um, when he was, um, when I first interviewed with him, he said, so, you know, Willie, we want you to come in and do this. Um, you know, how's, where's your wife in this whole thing? I said, Quite honestly, she's not very happy about this. This is not a move she'd want to make. And he said, well, I can relate. He was at IBM 22 years and moved 17 times. Um, and he said, my wife hated it to start. Then now she loves it. She's an international citizen. She sort of got over it. And he said, what about your kids? And I said, well, Turner at the time was four. Kate was two. You know, I said, they're too young. They're not even going to know about Virginia, San Diego. It doesn't really matter. He said, yeah, uh, that's good. And I said, what about your kids? How did they handle being moved around the world from IBM? And he said something that he saw the look in my face. He said, well, I have three kids and two of them made it. And he saw the look on my face. And he's like, oh, no, 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 they're, they're all fine, but my two daughters, not, not an issue. Right? They moved around the world, international citizens. One lives in Paris, one lives in New York. Didn't lay a glove on them. My son needed to have roots, and he really struggled. And he had a hard time in school, had a hard time learning. And, it just, and I thought, wow, that's a big price for somebody to pay. You know, I might screw my kids up in New News, but at least I wouldn't screw them by moving them around the, the country. So you, you have to think about those things, but you've got to think about the personal side. Can you live with those decisions? It's not about the money and the positions and everything else. You've got you to live with these decisions that you're negotiating for a long time. And, but it was tough. I mean, I came back, came back here, and this is not exactly the, the end of the high-tech world, but you can see the end of the high-tech world from here, right? It's... Um, and so, you know, I, I'd be sitting in my office and Steve Kahn, one of the, my board members from Advent International, would come in and say, hey, Willie, we're putting $15 million in this company in Boston. I want you to be the CEO. Come on up and let's talk. And I go, oh, no, Steve, I'm having a great time in Newport News. You know, <laughs> not, so, not so much. But that was my problem, right? I made a decision and then I, I resented it. And that's not helpful. Right? I chose not to go to Singapore and with all that men. And so don't blame Patty, don't blame the world, don't blame Newper News. And it took, you know, the, the trading room here is named for Mark Cooper, C. Marcus Cooper, a dear friend of mine. And, and he, he got me straight. And this is a free advice, again, worth what you paid for it. We went out to lunch and I was whining and complaining about here I am, this, you know, big CEO and I'm in Newper News. And I got nothing to do. I'm, frustrated and blah, blah, blah. And he just looked at, right at me and said, oh, shut up. He said, get over yourself. He said, if Sam Walton can create Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas, where there's nothing, can't you do something here? And as soon as I took that advice on board and started thinking about it the right way, I started another company, sold it six months later, and you know, did the big leverage buyout for Jerry Miller. And you know, so get in a group of people that will put it on you. Get friends that will put it on you and, and talk through these things with you, not just listening to your whining and complaining, but actually getting you to make those, those, those sort of tough decisions. All right, let me throw another poser at you from a negotiation standpoint. One of the things that, um, if I go back to that picture, you might imagine there's a very complex um, optics chassis in there that, that aligns. You have three light sources, red, green, and blue, and you have the, the um, liquid crystal um, light valves, and you've got to get the optics just right to go through that. And we had a small company in Canada had, that had developed that um, optics chassis. Um, but it was very expensive. You know, Hughes was buying them in the ones and twos and tens. Um, when you start thinking about doing hundreds of thousands of them, you just can't afford to build them one at a time. So JVC was in what is called a Koretsu. It's a group of companies that work closely together with Nikon. So they were going to go, and we were going to be meeting with Nikon to see if Nikon would take on manufacturing and supply that particular device. I get to the meetings. We're having our pre-briefing 
um, before going to the meetings with my staff over there. And one of the people says, oh yeah, we're going to send the designs to Nikon. Anybody see any problems with that? As brilliant negotiators and lawyers. <laughs> Makes sense. But, but also remember what I said, you know, the Canadian firm designed the optics for us and supplied the optics for us. Anybody? Yeah. So anybody see any IP concerns there? Right? So now the Canadian company owned the intellectual property to those, to that design. We bought the module from them. So you're now the CEO, you're getting ready to go, meet, and one of your people says, oh, I'm just going to send somebody else's intellectual property to a competitor. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> That's the right answer, <laughs> by the way. But That's just not right. And again, this gets to the cultural differences. In Japan, they share lots of this information. They're in a karetsu together. They've got cross-ownership of the companies. You've got to understand that. And I had to say, hey, hold it, hold it. We don't do business just exactly what Vic is saying. That the laws in America are not going to be kind to us if we're perceived as having shared somebody else's intellectual property. So said, we're not going to do that. You have to draw those lines. And so what I said is, look, they can buy one of these devices and tear it apart in reverse engineering, but we're not going to provide somebody else's intellectual property that's just a violation of our, we're not going to do that in the negotiations. And so that's where you start to see some of the cultural differences around the world. Make sense? Questions, thoughts? So this said, did, did, um, Wind up, there's the news, re news release saying JVC consolidates projector operations with absorption of huge JVC after we negotiated it all and got the Japanese CEO in place. Um, and say I came back to Virginia and they absorbed it um, in and um, unfortunately it, it, they never were able to get the cost down and we had, we had predicted that. We had predicted early on that they would never be able to get the cost down where they needed to to get in the commercial marketplaces. That's why I wanted to go after the digital micromirror devices, the three-gun projector displays, and the LCD um, projection displays as, you know, as the strategy. And other, other thoughts or observations for um, things? Uh, well, they were already in the joint venture and they didn't agree with the strategy of bringing in these other technologies. They thought they could commercialize whoever's got the light valve. They could bring those all the way down to a commercial version. And, and at that point, you've got two partners that just fundamentally disagree. Um, we thought we had all the agreements. We thought we were ready to go. And, and so those things happen. You just have to sort of stay on top. I think, it, you know, it. if you are prepared, it shouldn't matter where um, you have those. People do try to use it to their advantage, you know, going in the, the sauna, bringing them over here. And as managers, folks, the, the advice I would get you is get out of your office and go meet people where they are. You're much more likely to find that they're going to relax than if they're sitting across the desk from you or you summon them up to you know, your office. Um, so I think it, it helps to get away, but only if you know what your position is and you're comfortable. Really, it shouldn't matter where those discussions occur. Mm -hmm. What do you think the biggest or like most common mistake negotiations is? 
maybe for like in general or like people of ours? Um, I think it not really knowing all of the factors that are going to go into the to the decision. You know, being uninformed is just always disastrous, in my opinion. Um, and then I think, you know, compromising your values is a big one. Right? That it, because even if you're successful in the negotiation, you got to look at yourself in the mirror. You got to live with that for a long, long time. So that's a biggie. And then. Too many people go into the negotiation selfishly, only wanting to get what they want. And so back to, you know, that just makes it hard, right? If you don't understand um, and try for a win-win or some, you know, combination that, that works for the other partner. I mean, if it's just a one-time transaction, then sort of less important. But if you're going to have to live with the consequences of this decision for a while, make sure it's a good one. <laughs> Ivan Ewan, <clears throat> we'll be talking about Tuesday. You never know when you're going to see another person. You may think it's a one time deal, and that book discusses a deal where he sold a house to someone and he could have taken advantage of the person in the sale home, but they did an appropriate negotiation. And then years later, he was pitching an idea to a company, and the guy he sold the house to was on the board. And he got the he got the project because the guy on the board remembered how fair he was and the integrity he had years before in a completely unrelated situation. So you can never underestimate the value of being um, appropriate, having integrity, you know, working with your own values. Assuming your values are positive, right? Um, you know, doing the right thing. You can never underestimate doing the right thing because you don't know in the future when you're going to see that person again. So you may think it's a one-time deal, not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so you know, a follow-up on that, one of the, <laughs> many of you have heard me talk about the Wells Dairy family and, and the Blue Bunny Ice Cream Company. That, that job came directly from Mike Armstrong, who was familiar with the family and had been on their board for a while, and he said, here's the guy you need to call to get a bunch of parties together He's the best, and and so that's high praise. And if I had told Hughes to just go pound sand, you never get that call. So you just never know when when it's going to come back to haunt you. What else? Don't be shy. So and I also, folks, I realize you know I'm talking at a very very high level. You know, boards of directors and CEO and everything else, but it all translates, right? You're going to be in the same position. You. Not going to have the leverage, et cetera, but use these skills and don't compromise on your values. And if you do or you have to because I need the salary or this is the only job I have that's in Fairfax, like own that. Right? Recognize you made it for that particular reason. Don't blame somebody else. Don't blame the company. Don't blame the Democrats or the Republicans. Don't blame the tax code. You know, own those decisions. Do you have any advice for um, making this, like huge blunders or mistakes? So you go into like your first negotiation, you're really nervous, you completely fall and make a fool of yourself. How do you recover after? Like, what are some steps that you would recommend taking? Um, yeah, I'm. A, I'm a again. I'm a big fan of humility. Is just you know a letter. Um, one, if you interview anywhere these days, you know everyone says email a thank you note. So that's number one. If you handwrite a thank you note, I'm going to tell you you're at the top of the pile because nobody does that anymore. Right? So you stand out as somebody who cares, but just be humble. Own the fact that you blew it. If you can, and there's still a, a, a potential, admit your mistake. Say, look, I really blew it. I thought you were talking about this. I completely blew it. If you still want to consider me, I'd love to be a part of your company. Now, if that's where again, if you told them that, you know, they could go pound sand, and <laughs> you'll you'll be oh, they'll be hearing from your lawyers. You're probably not going to get a call back, right? And that it's, um, I, I will tell you, one of the things about negotiations and lawyers and, and this is that the, the environment can get very, very charged and people are going to make assumptions. So one of the jobs I was hired to do years ago, it turns out that the hiring manager lied to me. Um, that became clear within days of, of showing up. Um, and everybody got really tense really fast. 
And my strategy was I went to the HR person and said, look, I have every right to sue you. I'm not going to do that. We're going to unwind this thing elegantly so that you don't get disrupted. I get back my life back. And as soon as that happened, everything changed. I said, I will sue you if you screw that up. <laughs> but at first blush, because that's what so many people worry about. Right? And they get all, the, you know, it tightens up. So if you can if you can be very clear about, I'm taking that off the table unless you're unreasonable, then hopefully you can get to people to, to agree. But it's hard. I mean, this stuff is easy to talk about, folks. And, you know, your emotions are going to kick in. And that's where the more you know about the environment and about yourself, that hopefully those emotions won't take over. Oh, you should always be networking. I mean, it, it just don't miss that opportunity, folks. The world's too small a place. I, I'll give you an example. I was flying back from Detroit with the C Fund, having pitched at the um, University of Michigan, woman sitting next to me. I just introduced myself just to be um, neighborly, and, and um, we got talking. Turns out she's a pharmaceutical executive, PhD, um, biochemist, retired to the Northern Neck, interested in doing stuff and getting involved. Um, and so I put her in touch with a CNU student, and that student is doing some research for her, right? So you just never know when you're going to run into those people. And then you can, you know, you can be very intentional about it. Going out to, um, one of the things I wanted to get better when I was running Envy Corporation, I had not studied a lot in marketing, and I, wanted, I just wanted to get better at, at particularly high-tech marketing. Um, and I identified a guy named Dick, Dick Hoare, who was a legend in Silicon Valley, and he was going to be at a conference I was speaking at. And I just said, I'm going to find a way to meet this guy and see if I can't learn from him, get him to, to you know, become what, what I would encourage you to do. I've used a thing that I call personal boards of advisors, people that are talented, successful people who will put it on you and, and help you get where you want to get. Um, so I knew who he was. I knew what he looked like. And lo and behold, first night at the hotel, we're heading for the, the elevator, and there he is. So I introduced myself, told him who I was, and we became famous friends. <laughs> Um, and just for the price of a dinner in San Francisco, I learned a tremendous amount and got a, you know, a great resource. So don't discount those opportunities, right? Keep your antenna up. How do you maintain that network? Because once you create a broad network, how do you keep in touch with everyone? Well, that's just it. It used to be hard, right? Because you had to get out of pad and write a you know write a letter and put a stamp on it and send it easy now you know just a quick email to somebody hey Vivian how you doing you know let's catch up soon let's get a cup of coffee I'm gonna be in LA you know can I buy you dinner it's just it's simple folks this is just civility this is this is just basically being a nice approachable person now I will tell you there are people who will try to take advantage of that and that's you know, just walk away from those people once they once they do it, right? But I, I wouldn't go through life with your suit of armor on, you know, and, and be unapproachable and miss those opportunities. But you will. You'll find that, that people um, just, some will, will be gracious and accommodating and some won't. That's okay. Just go with the gracious accommodating people and leave the jerks alone. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you an interesting story of a CNU student wanted to work for, um, who's the guy on the Shark Tank? What's that? Mark, Mark Cuban, yeah. Wanted to work for Mark Cuban. And I said, what are you doing about it? He said, well, I don't know. I don't know any. I said, write him a letter. He wrote him a letter every single week for two years here. And finally, we were in Einstein's, and he said, I'm giving up. I'm not. I'm, I'm Sent all the letters, I'm not going to do it, he's just not going to respond. About a week later, he's walking down the street and his cell phone rings, didn't recognize the number, but answered it. And it said, hi, um, I won't give you his name, but it said, um, this is Mr. Cuban's secretary, he wants to talk to you. <laughs> and Mark Cuban got on the phone with him and said, 
anybody who is persistent enough to write me 321 letters or however many it was, I got to talk to. He said, I'm going to put my assistant back on and we're going to fly you out here. I want to meet you. He worked for him for two and a half years. Wow. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's just, you know, when I hear students like you say, oh, I can't do this or I can't do that. Um, I had a senior student from Richmond. He said, I said about you the other day, he said, I would sweep floors for this company in Richmond, investment firm. And I said, so write the CEO a letter and tell him that or her. Are you serious? He said, yeah. I said, tell him that. Go, go stand in front of their you know, lobby with a broom and offer. <laughs> Just start sweeping for that matter, right? Don't stalk people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about getting a mentor? Um, well, you know, Fred Hoare was a was an example. You know, find somebody. Don't go with an easy crowd. You got plenty of friends that'll be easy on you. Don't go with somebody who um, can't help you grow. Get with people that can help you. You know, and talk with them. Ask them. Can I? Can I learn from you? Can I buy you dinner? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can we go to the, when you get to your new jobs, find those people out. Find the person in HR that you want to emulate and ask if, if you can learn from them. And then be intentional about it. You can always buy me this. That's right. I'm open to that. Yeah. I, actually. All right, well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Oh, okay. Thank you.